This week on Christian World News, Iran's silent revolution. The mullahs may be in charge, but the people are quietly turning from Islam. Many are embracing Jesus Christ. And miracle in Sudan. After 30 years as an Islamic Republic, the nation moving towards democracy? What does it mean for the church? And do this for love, the missionary family that's serving in some of the world's most dangerous places. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. And I'm Wendy Griffith. Well, we have reported for years on the changes taking place inside Iran. Now we know it's a dramatic transformation going on. It absolutely on. is. A first of its kind survey reveals monumental changes in Iranians' attitudes toward their, faith, their traditional faith and their government. Take a look. For 14 days in June, two Dutch professors interviewed more than 50,000 Iranians online for an unprecedented survey covering topics from faith to politics to religious life. The authors say they discovered a huge shift that should fundamentally change how we look at Iran today. One major standout from professors Poiman Tamina Arab and Amar Maliki is that despite Iran's census claims that 99.5% of the population is Shiite Islam, only 32% of their respondents identified as such. The next largest group are the nons at 22%, which led the authors to conclude that Iranians are abandoning religion for secularism. Broadly speaking, this survey is important because it puts data behind the largely non-empirical argument that analysts have been forced to deal with, which is that Iranian society is less religious. This survey, this data proves that Iranian society is exceptionally less religious. Approximately half of the population reported losing their religion. 60% said they do not pray anymore. Younger people reported higher levels of dissatisfaction with religion. And an overwhelming number of respondents were critical of authorities using strict Islamic laws to govern daily life. For example, 72% of those surveyed opposed the law mandating all women to wear a hijab, the Islamic veil covering. And when the authors dug a little deeper on questions central to that faith, even less numbers believed in the core tenets of Shia Islam. Only 37% believed in life after death. 30% believed in heaven and hell. An even lower number, 25%, believed in the coming of their Islamic savior known as the Mahdi or 12th Imam. All of these trends, the pushback on the hijab, the lack of belief in the, in the coming of the Mahdi, the lack of a willingness to identify with Shiism, the willingness to identify with other faiths, are all a result of politics in the past 40 years of the Iranian government. And as the Islamic Republic has tried to shove religion down the throat of Iranians to mask their authoritarian grasp on power, you've seen Iranians contest their authoritarianism by contesting faith itself. The survey also revealed that as Islam diminishes, Christianity is growing. 1.5% of those surveyed identified themselves as Christian. And that is compared to about uh, 30 years ago being less than 1%. Uh, that less than 1%, everybody thought it was less than 0.5%. Uh, Mike Ansari of Mohabbat TV, a ministry that broadcasts the gospel into Iran, tells CBN News the survey is significant because it lends credence to what mission groups have been saying for years. This data is important because it's indicative of the fact that uh, in the country of Iran, in the midst of persecution and Islamic rule, Iranians are turning their back uh, to, to their faith, to their institutional faith, and, and receiving Christianity as a new faith. Iran is one of the most dangerous places for Christians and other minority faith groups. Non-Muslims are often arrested or severely tortured for sharing or practicing their faith. Yet, in a sign of changing times, the survey found that 41% of respondents believed all religions should have the right to public proselytizing, and around 54% said it was a good idea for their children to learn about other faiths in school. 
George, this is exciting. So sure how is, yeah. significant is this survey? It is, absolutely. I mean, you see 54% of, uh, of parents with children said it's a good idea to teach their children not just about Islam, but about other faith groups as well, which hmm. is so, so significant in a place like Iran. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. All right, good story. Well, Iran isn't the only country seeing major changes after a 2019 military coup toppled a 30-year dictatorship. The Sudanese government is moving away from Islamic fundamentalism and get this, towards democracy. Yeah, it's quite remarkable. While the turnaround is remarkable, some say it's too early to tell if the changes will last. CBN's Gary Lane brings us that story. Two million people have died, millions remain homeless. Three decades of civil war and resisting Sharia law have ended, bringing new hope for the people of Sudan. For 30 years, CBN News has reported extensively in order to raise awareness of their plight. Great. Our stories inspired American Christians to provide much needed help. The people of South Sudan gained independence from the North in 2011, but the struggle continued for others, like the people of the Nuba Mountains. Christians in the north suffered imprisonment and Islamists destroyed churches. A military coup brought change in 2019 with the removal of Omar al-Bashir. That brought change with a pledge to transition the country to democracy and free elections. Enough is enough is what the people have been saying for a number of years and finally they've had their way. I think the real challenge though is going to be if it sticks. In late August, several rebel and political groups signed a peace agreement, ending the civil war and moving Sudan closer to democracy and freedom. The transitional government abolished the death penalty for apostates, those leaving Islam. Also, the government moved to separate the state from religion. That means Islam is no longer the basis of law in Sudan. The voice of the martyrs, Todd Nettleton, says Sudanese Christians feel they now have a window of opportunity for ministry. Their attitude is we don't know how long this window is going to stay open. So right now it's open. Let's go 100 miles an hour and minister and work on behalf of the kingdom of Christ. And so they see this as a real opportune moment for gospel work in Sudan. Hardwired Global President Tina Ramirez is concerned about the prospects for lasting change. She says winning the war may be easier than winning the peace. Uh, you know, even though Bashir is not there, the military rulers that held him in power for more than three decades are still there and are the ones negotiating this peace. And so the real the real proof is going to be in the next few years if it, it enters into the real permanent constitution after this transitional government. The Trump administration is promising millions of dollars in investment and development to encourage the democratic shift. Before that can happen, however, Sudan must not be designated as a state sponsor of terror. The U.S. has brokered a deal that would drop Sudan from the terror list once it pays a $335 million settlement to victims of the 1998 attacks on the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. That deal is currently stalled in the U.S. Senate. Meanwhile, Nettleton says Christians need to keep praying for Sudan. Our former Africa Regional Director Peter Yasik was imprisoned in Sudan for 14 months. Many people, because of his story, prayed for that country. And I wonder if some of what we're seeing now is the fruit of those prayers. We need to keep praying that this transition will go forward peacefully and that our Christian brothers and sisters, their rights will be respected under the ultimate new government of Sudan. Gary Lane, CBN News. Up next, the missionary who risks his life in some of the most dangerous places on earth. The title of his latest book says it all. Do this for love. These are times of warfare. You go into the strong tower when you're under attack. CBN presents The Name of God. The latest teaching by Gordon Robertson. God has given you the right to carry his name. That is life change. Discover the peace, healing, provision, and protection that can be found in the Lord's name. Plus, you are going to see some tremendous real life stories of people who have seen firsthand what trusting in the name of God can do. The thought of losing Noah was one of the most terrifying things I've ever walked through. I could hear my house being shredded, and I heard my wife screaming over the phone. I knew that God didn't lie to me. I knew that God didn't forget about me. This is God's promise. This is the way. This is the answer. Go into that strong tower. 
Get your DVD copy of The Name of God today. Call now or go to CBN.com. Nutrition, exercise, essential oils, weight loss, and more. It's Healthy Living with Lori Johnson. Talk about what's in this. Join CBN health reporter Lori Johnson to get the latest information from today's top health experts. This is fantastic. Find out what you need to know to live a healthier life. Watch Healthy Living, Tuesday night at 930. As the world watches from the outside. It's a big diplomatic tug of war here in the Middle East. Go inside the story with Jerusalem Dateline. Israeli archaeologists are talking about a discovery that could change the thinking about the Temple Mount. Join CBN Jerusalem Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell and get the biblical perspective on the events shaping the world. What starts in Israel then ends up going to other places. Watch Jerusalem Dateline Friday night at 930 on the CBN News Channel. Welcome back to Christian World News. Dave Eubank is a missionary to some of the most dangerous places in the world. In the 1990s, he founded the Free Burma Rangers to serve an oppressed tribal people in the jungles of Burma. Then, in 2015, God called Dave and his family to northern Iraq and Syria to serve and minister to people under assault from ISIS. He has now written a book about that experience called Do This for Love. Free Burma Rangers in the Battle of Mosul. Dave is just back in the States from his work in the Middle East. I talked with him about his missionary adventures, the church in the Middle East, and the power of love. Well, you and your family were really on the front lines of, of the war against ISIS for so long. We saw incredible video of you rescuing people and uh, dodging bullets. You know, tell us more about what is now happening in Syria and what's the threat to Christians now that ISIS is gone? The biggest threat in northeast Syria now is the Turkish invasion, which occurred last year. Mm. There were 200,000 Christians in northeast Syria. There's 40,000 something left. And they're barely hanging on. There, there's also Christians under Assad, and he pretty much leaves them alone if they keep their mouths shut. And so the biggest threat are the radical jihadis. However, the only freedom I've seen in Syria is over on the Kurdish side. And so I want to encourage our viewers, please pray yeah. for every country. We don't want any of them to be our enemies, but pray especially for the Kurds and the Christians in northeast Syria that the Americans would stay. America cannot solve the problem at all. We don't have to. But by being there, we give people an opportunity to solve the problem. Interesting. All right. Well, Dave, you talk about love casting out fear. How does that work in the dangerous places that you've been in? Well, it, it works because of the power of Jesus. And I've experienced over and over again, when I call on his name, something happens. When I thank him, no matter what's happening, I thank him. Jesus, thank you. This is a terrible situation. For example, in our country, this is a terrible situation right now, but thank you, Jesus. And remembering, oh, they're all my family. Just like you don't get to choose your brother and sister in your own family, you don't get to choose who's American. We're all Americans. We don't have to agree, but we have to respect each other. We're made in God's image, every one, and it is our family. There's no other one. There's no other Americans to pull in. This is what we got. And the only way through is love. And to me, when you've been hurt, when you've had injustice happen, you, without, for me, without Jesus helping me, I can't love. And I, I'll show you the cover of this book. This is the one I just wrote, Do This for Love, Freedom Rangers in the Battle of Mosul. This little girl, her name is Demoa. She's alive now, but she was the only living kid hiding under her mother who was dead for three days. And ISIS was killing everybody around. They had anti-tank systems. You couldn't get an armored vehicle down that street. And how are you gonna save her? You gotta save her. And I remember thinking, whoever goes to get her is gonna die. I don't wanna die. I got wife and kids too. And what's the point of dying and not getting to her? But then I, and then I prayed and I remembered, gosh, I gotta help her, I gotta help her. It could be my daughter. And I thought if there was a man looking at my daughter against the wall mm. in another country and everybody's dying and he said, Dave, if I help her, I'll die. What would I say as a father? I say, please try, please try. And greater love hath no man than this, he laid down his life for his friends. So I went in love and I remember running from behind the tank, bullets going everywhere thinking, I'm dead, I'm dead. There's no way to live. Everybody else is dead here. But thinking my wife and kids will understand if I die trying to save this kids. This is not for pride. Wow. This is not for hate. This is for love. And God gave us the opportunity to save that girl. And she is now with her grandmother. And you know what her grandmother told me? We didn't meet for almost a year when it was over. Her grandmother told me, 
looking at that time frame, I had a dream. I was in Baghdad. I thought all my family was killed. My daughter, I, I knew my daughter was killed and son was killed. I didn't know I had any grandchildren left, but I had a dream. And it turns out if the dream was on 2 June, same day we did the rescue. She said, I saw my granddaughter against the wall, hiding against my daughter's dead body and dead all around. And there was a putrid evil stream that separated them from life. And suddenly this man shining in white stepped across the stream and rescued my granddaughter. I said, that was Jesus. Wow. Jesus sent us. And so whoever's watching this, remember Jesus sends you. When you ask him, Lord, what can I do? I hate those people. I'm mad. Ask for love and he will send you and he'll go with you. And the people on their side, they may just see a little person, but behind you, they're going to feel the power of the almighty God who sent his son, Jesus, to save us and is still with us presently to help. And I've experienced that when I'm afraid, when I'm proud, when I'm angry. If I say, Jesus, help me, he enables me to do things I can't do on my own. Dave, how would you encourage Christians to begin finding God's call in their own lives? How can they start? I think first, say, Jesus, show me my sins and forgive me. Clean me out so I can see where, what to go to do. And then second step, take all your hopes and dreams and your good agendas and your bad agendas. Don't hide them. Even the embarrassments, put them up on his altar and say, God, I put everything up there. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Mm. I love the saying, I don't know if John Piper, whoever said it, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive because the world needs people who've come alive. And you're going to get back what makes you come alive. And when and you get it back, run with it, with all your might, with faith. Faith is the only way you're going to be able to go forward. Don't go to the swamp of sin on your right, which is sin. Don't stay there. Don't yeah. go to the swamp of Christian good things that you do to please others, but God did not ask you to do. Mm. Go on that line he gave you. There's no slow sign. There's no caution. There's no be careful. It's go, man, how much faith you got. And so that's what I want to encourage people to do. Ask you, give everything to him, and then go for it. Go for it. And don't be afraid. God's going to tell you if to turn another direction. Don't worry about that. He's a modern day hero. I was and just I've seen say him. The same I've thing. seen. I was in northern Syria, uh, right there. Uh, you when, saw him in action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were all there. We were on the front lines. He's, amazing. Yeah, he's quite modern day hero indeed. He really is. All right. Well, coming up. Secular critics believe religion should be kept out of the public square. But did you know that biblical principles shaped our founding document? That story when we come back. From Washington, D.C., uncompromising stories, interviews, and analysis from veteran journalists, David Brody. That could be the next step in this escalating fight. Jenna Browder. Robert Mueller chose his words carefully. Ben Kennedy. He's asking Christians to get the word out. Bringing you the political news that matters. Get out and tell the story of the progress that we're making in this country. Watch Faith Nation. Weeknights at 6 on the CBN News Channel. Orphan's Promise is committed to loving and serving at-risk children, to helping keep families together, and to creating opportunities for strong and sustainable communities around the world. We're working in over 60 countries around the world, and with your help, we can do even more. There's an old African proverb I love that says, if you want to run fast, run alone. But if you want to run far, run together. At Orphan's Promise, we want to run far so we can touch the lives of as many orphaned and vulnerable children as possible. But we don't want to go alone. We're out to change the world, one child, one family, one community at a time. Will you join us? The name of God, a new teaching from Gordon Robertson. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Gain important insights into the protection available to you in the name of God. Discover how God is our healer, our provider, and the one who gives us peace. Plus, see exciting true stories of God's providence in the lives of real people. You get the answer to everything, and that answer will never leave you. The name of God, available now. U.S. Attorney General William Barr says religion and public life is under assault in America. Addressing the virtual National Catholic Prayer Breakfast Wednesday, Barr says America's founders recognized the critical link between religion and freedom. 
But now it's under siege by, quote, militant secularists. And the erosion of America's religious foundation, he says, has led to more broken families and violence in our cities. You know, some say God or religion shouldn't be part of the public square. But as Paul Strand reports, America's founding document is based on biblical principles. The U.S. Constitution, written and signed by our founding fathers, sits here in the National Archives. These founders saw themselves as men of faith and used what they learned in God's Word to help them form their new nation's law and government. So I like to say it's not that we established a Christian country, but without Christian values, we would never establish this kind of country. We are shaped by the Bible. Outside the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, historian Peter Lilback showed me phrase by phrase how the preamble of the Constitution reflects these biblical values. It begins by saying, we the people of the United States uh, come together to make a more perfect union. They want to be one, they know they can't be perfect. That's a biblical idea. We're trying to get better, We're, we can progress. Then establish justice. Lilback quotes Micah 6.8. The Lord has shown you what he requires of you, O man, that you would do justice and love mercy. Justice is a biblical concern. Ensure domestic tranquility. Paul will say in Romans chapter 12, as much as lies within me, I will live at peace with all men. Provide for the common defense. So we know that one of the great principles of God's law is to defend the orphan and the widow. Promote the general welfare. We should do good to all men, especially to those of the household of faith. And secure the blessings of liberty. I always like to say that the word blessing is a word you don't hear atheists using. The very nature of blessing is something that's being given to us from God. And liberty is something that God has blessed us with. And then the Constitution lays out our legislative and judicial and executive branches of government. And all three reflect different aspects of God himself that are shown in the Bible. In Isaiah 33, 22, where it talks about how our God is a God who's a lawgiver. He is, in fact, a judge. He is also a king or a ruler. Again, derivative of God's very word, God's very nature. Lilback sums up what the Bible did for America through our founders. By learning from his word, we gain wisdom, and that wisdom creates, if you will, the longest continuously used constitution on the face of the earth. And September 17, 2020, marks the 233rd birthday of that historic freedom guaranteeing document. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the National Archives. Paul, looking very sharp there. Yes, Trying indeed. to look like you, I think. Oh, good luck, Paul. <laughs> well, celebrating the high holy days under a COVID-19 lockdown. That story when we come back. Stay with us, folks. It's about the competition. I kind of put that pressure on myself, and I think people had expectations. It's about overcoming. We use this phrase all the time, keep chopping, keep practicing hard. It's about going the distance. You know, I think as a father, it's my job, you know, to lead, just be the best husband and father I can be. Watch Going the Distance with Sean Brown, Saturday night at 7.30 on the CBN News Channel. I'm Ephraim Graham, and this is Studio 5. Cruise with me as I discover the good things happening in the world of music, sports, television, and movies. The fact that Ryan Coogler was going to be directing the film, I knew that something special was going to happen. We'll chat with artists at the forefront of entertainment and explore the connection between popular culture and faith. I asked my pastor, I said, well, does that mean I'm supposed to be a preacher? He says, well, no, you already have a pulpit. Watch Studio 5, Wednesday night at 9.30. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. CBN presents the name of God, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. Jehovah Yira. The Lord will provide. Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there. Jehovah Rapha. The Lord who heals. Jehovah Sidkenu. The Lord our righteousness. You'll be encouraged by Gordon Robertson's teaching on the name of God. God has given you the right to carry his name. 
Plus, you'll see exciting true stories of God's providence in the lives of real people. I could hear my house being shredded when I heard my wife screaming. I knew something was seriously wrong with him, and it was worse than we had thought. Become a CBN partner and get your copy of The Name of God. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to CBN.com. Finally this week, Israel's second lockdown comes at a time of the biblical high holy days. Yes, CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl takes a look at how some are handling prayers under the lockdown. Each year, people travel to Jerusalem from around the world to pray at the great synagogue and hear the choir. For the first time in more than 60 years, the synagogue is closed and will not mark the high holidays. The synagogue may be closed, but the gate of heavens are opened. That change, however, isn't stopping prayer. When we knew that the synagogue will not be open, I got some ideas, let's bring the atmosphere of the synagogue, part of it, to this place. Whoever will come, will come. We'll bring some members of the choir. I will conduct the service in dual function, both as conductor and as a cantor. World-renowned conductor Eli Jaffe also directs the synagogue's choir. During Rosh Hashanah recently, Jaffe and a few choir members took services outside. The sound was heavenly. This time is a difficult time. So we really want to really repent and to become better people and to wait for the Messiah to come after such a disaster year. But now a week into this lockdown, Jaffe may find himself singing alone. In the book of Leviticus, the Bible says, in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you. For 25 hours, Jewish people fast with no food or water and usually spend much of that time praying in the synagogue. Since the March lockdown, morning and evening prayer services have moved outside in neighborhoods like this one. So we are trying to shorten the service in order to make sure that people will be able to uh, adjust themselves and not to get too tired. But uh, we hope to do the best and that God should hear our prayers. On Yom Kippur, some synagogues will open for a limited number of worshipers. But despite the hot weather, many will likely be praying outside. Though Orthodox Jews won't turn on electricity on holidays, the reform movement says it will live stream its Yom Kippur prayers. Even with the difficulty of the situation, Jaffe believes it's important to see the good in everything. The virus brought a lot of tragedies. Many people died, many people are sick. But on the other hand, it brought people together. It brought uh, unity. It brought love between, between people. And there are lessons to be learned. Love the other person give charity and always think of the almighty that's the best thing to do he never leaves you even if you think he does we don't understand everything he does it's not for us to understand that's the way and keep smiling chris mitchell cbn news keep smiling <laughs> we, we initially said it was julie Stahl's report but it was actually chris mitchell that was but, chris yes yeah you know he had a line that said uh, the gates of the church or the orthodox uh, the synagogue may be closed but the gates of heaven are always open and keep smiling that's right folks that is it for this week's edition of christian world news until next week goodbye from all all of us here god bless you <laughs>